Welcome to Salt Lake City. Toxicologists from around the country are calling Salt Lake home this week. SOT TV is here again to bring you all the very best of this year's SOT annual meeting. I'm excited uh, about toxicology's ability to adapt uh, to the environment and for us to be able to help uh, protect and, and improve public health uh, to the increasing changes that we see on a regular basis. I'm very excited about tools that might come in the future with the help of artificial intelligence, especially how artificial intelligence can be used in risk assessment, in predictive toxicology, and move away from uh, as much as possible from in vivo animal studies. Today, we're focusing on all the incredible innovation that has come out of this field. And we are looking to the future to see what's on the horizon. You're watching SOT TV. There's more to come on SOT TV. SOT TV starts now. Hi, I'm Tanya Papanicholas. I am here all week with SOT TV to make sure you don't miss all the amazing research, ideas, and technology that this meeting has to offer. Today's episode is all about exploring what's on the cutting edge of the field. When you think about SOT, you really have to focus on the mission of the organization, and it really is to make the world a safer and healthier place. We will learn from Robin Tangway about how SOT is bringing in researchers from across multiple disciplines to advance toxicology. I've always been really interested in the interrelated relationships between the health of the environment and the health of humans. And in order to really study this well, you need an interdisciplinary approach. Then Kristen Eccles will share how her background in geographic information systems shapes her research in computational toxicology. Plus, we'll visit some of the nation's leading research centers to see how they're using isotope tracer technologies, cloud computing, and community engagement to boost the field. But first, we're sitting down with 2024 SOT Achievement Award recipient, Phoebe Stapleton, to learn more about her work in understanding the adverse effects of particles inhaled during pregnancy. Joining us now in the studio is Phoebe Stapleton. She is the recipient of the 2024 SOT Achievement Award. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. And congratulations on your award too. Thank you, thank you so much. That's so exciting. Is. So your research is really fascinating. At Rutgers you are studying how microplastics and nanoplastics that could be inhaled by pregnant mothers may affect the mother, may affect the fetus, and then the child as it develops. Tell us how you got interested in this topic to begin with. So my background is in cardiovascular physiology, and then in my postdoc, I started working in inhalation toxicology. And then we started to ask the question of how something a mother inhales during pregnancy could affect the developing fetus. And notice that in the epidemiology literature for humans, we see an association between air pollution exposure and fetal growth restriction. So I really wanted to understand the mechanisms of how that occurs. What have you found when it comes to the transfer of microplastics from the placenta to the fetus? So we found that it happens, okay. and that's not something that one would kind of assume because that placenta is supposed to act as a biological barrier. It's only supposed to let good things in and have bad things come out. And so the fact that these particles are getting through, which are like small grains of sand or even smaller, the fact that it's allowing them through is a concern unto itself. How is the cardiovascular system particularly at risk with the exposure? Well, the cardiovascular system unites all of those systems. It's the track from the lung to the placenta to the fetus. And so it's really the roadway for these particles to be able to get there is what we're assuming at this point. So tell me how you're hoping that your discoveries will shape the future of toxicology. So for the future of toxicology, I guess my hope is that we'll continue to break down silos. Our work looks at cardiovascular toxicology, inhalation, nanotoxicology, reproductive and developmental toxicology. When we're going to continue our work collaborating with neurotoxicologists, those involved in liver toxicology as well. So just to continue to break down those silos or those individual experiments, try to get a better holistic outcome of what these particles are really doing in the maternal fetal system. Well, thank you so much for sharing your insight with thank us. Thank you so much. And you're in luck because if you want to find out more about Phoebe's research, she is presenting on Tuesday evening in Grand Ballroom F. 
Well, unfortunately, potential for unwanted exposures doesn't start or stop with micro and nanoplastics. Let's go now to LSU, where their Superfund research program is engaging with communities concerned about their proximity to hazardous waste. The Louisiana State University Superfund Research Program is a program that is funded by the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences, which is a division of the NIH. And the program is centered around uh, reducing the health impacts associated with exposure to hazardous waste from Superfund sites. One of the goals of the Superfund Research Program is to build resilience in our community partners. So we really want to provide data and information. Working with the Superfund gotten answers to questions. We've made some tremendous discoveries. At a basic science level, we've made them at a level that can impact human health. We've changed public policy in some places, and we're actually developing things that we can put in incinerators that uh, will even improve the ability of incinerators to remove these hazardous components from the air. And so I think that's a tremendous bonus. We don't often see that with research, and so I'm pretty excited about those things. You can keep watching SOT TV on screens around the Salt Palace Convention Center, in your room at select hotels, on the SOT 2024 Annual Meeting website, on the SOT 2024 Event app, and on YouTube and X. We are very excited right now to have joining us in studio SOT Counselor Dozy Amuzi and also SOT Postdoctoral Assembly Chair Anka Tooker. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. We're excited to talk to you guys. Now I want to know within SOT what kinds of groups do you guys have that help foster inclusion and strengthen community? I think SOT has lots of different groups that are geared towards all kinds of members like the undergrad groups, uh, grad students, postdoctoral groups, but then there's also all the special interest groups focusing on different regions all over the world. There's also um, what we call specialty sections because it recognizes that we have different allegiances based on how we are trained. So the special, specialty sections offer another component of how our group members are organized. Interesting, I love it. Tell me how being inclusive and fostering that kind of environment is so important within SOT and how it strengthens community. Inclusivity is not something that happens to us by chance. It's something that people have to be intentional about. So I think SOT by structurally organizing people according to special interest groups, which is um, cultural experiences and heritage sometimes, or um, regions where the people live, or special, so it, it makes sure that ideas or issues that arise within these groups can surface to the SOT leadership and they can use that to make decisions. So um, it strengthens the society because everybody's idea is coming up to the surface all the time. I want to know personally for you guys, kind of your experiences, how has your involvement in these groups created a positive experience for you within SOT? I think for me, it's I got to know how SOT works, like really the inner workings. If you're a member and you go to the meeting, you, you, you enjoy the meeting that's set up. But the moment you become involved in those leadership roles, whether that's a specialty section or the postdoctoral assembly, you really get to see how much effort is put into getting everything together and how all these special interest group and component groups connect with each other and communicate with council, with leadership to make things happen. For me, it's, it's allowed me to, within the component groups, whether they are specialty section or I belong to a group called Toxicologists of African Origin, there we, we zero in on issues that are more peculiar to the group. And then we take care of things we can take care of ourselves and then reach back to SOT leadership on the things that it can help us with to become productive members of the society. So if SOT members are listening and they want to find out more about how to get involved or find a group that may interest them, how do they go about doing that? Go to the website. Uh, also check out Talks Change to see whether open roles or leadership roles or people that are in leadership that you can reach out to and, and just volunteer and, and get involved. 
Right, volunteer would take on that and get involved because we participate, we become members of the community, and that's where most of the benefit comes from. I love that there are so many ways to get involved, and thank you guys both for sharing those ways with us so people can find out more. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's learn more now about how SOT is expanding its diversity and its reach by collaborating with researchers outside of toxicology. When you think about SOT, you really have to focus on the mission of the organization, and it really is to make the world a safer and healthier place by advancing science and, and toxicology, the impact of toxicology. So if we're gonna continue to do that, I think it's essential that we stay abreast of the newest knowledge and we're inclusive of bringing new technology, new people to our society to advance that ultimate goal of the society. So I think it's critical that we think about the mission of the Society of Toxicology, which is to make the world healthier and safer by advancing uh, the science of toxicology and the impact of the discipline. The SOT uses many approaches to bring in new, new talent to our, to our membership. Uh, it, it, right from the beginning, from recruitment, we try to recruit people from different disciplines, whether they're students or, or uh, experts who are in middle or later careers, to bring them in. And then we, have, we actually mentor them. To, so if they're not familiar with toxicology, but we can take their tools and adapt it to um, the goals of our members. Uh, we also do it the way we program our, our meeting. We ensure that we bring in people who are existing members and, and members from other, other sectors. So that's intentional. We also do it through our, our Talks Expo, where we bring in expertise and new, new approaches and, and bring them to our members so they can see new approaches that they might adapt. So it really helps our members, um, you know, they're advancing their own fields, but by leveraging the expertise of others, they can really leverage that, uh, those new approaches to, to, again, to advance their own research, but to advance the mission of the society as a whole. I think it's critical that we try to really actively try to strengthen the community. So the, the field is changing. The, the discipline is rapidly evolving. Our members are coming from different sectors. Our trainees are gonna be in a workforce that we don't recognize today. And by, by really bringing these two people, our new people into the society, we'll be able to make sure our members are, are really competitive to advance their careers. And uh, I think it's essential to maintain the health of the society but more importantly, the careers of our members. It's time to head now to St. Louis, Missouri, where Washington University's Patty Lab is pioneering innovative metabolics and isotope tracer technologies. Let's see how they're reimagining the metabolic basis of cancer and identifying previously unrecognized liabilities for therapeutic intervention. The Patty Laboratory is a interdisciplinary research operation that investigates a number of different topics. The primary goal really is to use various types of technologies to explore metabolism, particularly in the context of cancer. We're developing new ways to look at biochemistry using mass spectrometers, specifically looking at metabolites and proteins. But we also are applying those technologies to several different disease states, but primarily cancer. And that's what I'm really excited about because if we're able to take these technologies and apply them and we redefine the biochemical basis of disease, it's going to lead to a whole cascade of new biochemical targets that we can implement our therapeutic intervention strategies. You know, that's the endpoint we hope to improve people's lives and, and hope that we can ultimately improve care for patients with cancer. In general, uh, in toxicology, there's a lot of movement in ne new next generation risk assessment and new approach methodology, uh, specifically uh, computational tools. Uh, everyone is very much focused for good reasons to move away from in vivo to in vitro as much as possible. At the same time, we want to make sure that all, all the tools that we have, uh, adopt or come use uh, they give us accurate results that we currently get from in vivo uh, testing. I think the creation of novel uh, aerosol generators that can replicate the air pollution that we are exposed to constantly 
and it changes constantly, we need to be able to move uh, and model that in, in our laboratories if we're going to identify the health effects of those exposures. And I think that will transform toxicology as we go forward. I think um, toxicology will transform by next generation risk assessment, which is um, the new toxicology without animal testing. And it's absolutely future. You can do it with in silico or with in vitro testing. And the combination is fantastic. I think AI is going to completely transform technology. I mean, we're, we're looking at the power of, of AI in you know, so many different fields. And you know, in, in my personal life, um, I've just seen how you know, things like chat GPT have transformed my daily life. Joining us now in the studio is Kristen Eccles, who is a research scientist at Health Canada. Thanks for being with us. Oh, thank you for having me. Now, you have an interesting background because you have a PhD in biology, but you also did your master's in geographic information systems. So how has that background informed your research in toxicology? I've always been really interested in the interrelated relationships between the health of the environment and the health of humans. And in order to really study this well, you need an interdisciplinary approach, bridging methods that have been commonplace in geography, such as geographic information systems, which includes mapping, spatial analysis, and geospatial statistics with biology and understanding how chemicals that are in the environment perturb uh, biological pathways leading to an adverse health outcome. Do you feel like there are gaps in the way chemical risk assessments are traditionally done? There are a few key gaps in the way traditional chemical risk assessments are performed today. So first of all, we're exposed to chemical mixtures, but the way chemical risk assessment is done is traditionally on a chemical by chemical approach. A lot of these approaches also rely on in vivo animal toxicity testing data, which is costly to perform um, and only generates a, a set amount of data that informs on th your target of interest. The other challenge of traditional risk assessments is the focus on apical endpoints. So those are the adverse outcomes, such as cardiovascular disease or cancer. And we're really lacking information. It's a black box between when we're exposed to chemicals at the target site exposure and the adverse outcome. So what is the molecular chain of events that happens leading to this adverse outcome. So traditional risk assessments using animal models can't really inform on that as well as some of the new approach methods such as cell-based assays can. So tell me a little bit about the frameworks you're using to try and tackle these problems. So the two frameworks that we're using are the aggregate exposure pathway, which focuses on understanding the chemical fate and transport in the environment, and then going from the external exposure to the internal exposure within the body at the target site exposure with the adverse outcome pathway, which links biological information on initiation of the molecular initiating event all the way up to the adverse health outcome. And then tell us also within your framework how you're using geospatial and computational methods. The geospatial methods really apply well to the aggregate exposure pathway framework to understand um, the, the sources and patterns of chemicals in the environment. We're able to use geospatial methods such as mapping and spatial statistics to, for example, identify hotspots. And then computational methods that we're using for the adverse outcome pathway really rely on new approach methods, which are high throughput methods to generate a lot of data on the hazard of a chemical in a cell-based system. All of it sounds fascinating, and you can actually watch Kristen present her research Tuesday morning in Grand Ballroom B. Thanks, Kristen, for sharing all this with us. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Well, now we will close out today's episode learning about another innovation in computational toxicology. Meet the team behind the software startup DreamTech. My name is Kan Shao. I'm the founder and uh, president uh, of DreamTech. I'm Keith Davis, and I'm CEO of DreamTech. The fundamental goal of DreamTech is to develop and apply scientifically rigorous approaches and computational systems to help evaluate chemical toxicity and assess human health risks. 
We are very proud that we developed the Bayesian benchmark dose modeling system. We are the pioneer in this field. The idea of safety assessment for toxicologists is a complex idea. And so it's important to work collaboratively, but there's few, very few opportunities to do that or platforms. DreamTrack offers a platform. The platform's open to anybody. It's really exciting and freeing to sort of work on this software that's sort of revolutionizing the industry. With that, our first episode of SOT TV 2024 comes to an end. The excitement won't stop here though. We'll be back tomorrow and the next day with more content. If you wanna look back at all the highlights from today's episode, you can keep watching SOT TV on screens around the Salt Palace Convention Center, in your room at select hotels, on the SOT 2024 Annual Meeting website, on the SOT 2024 Event app, and on YouTube and X. Join us tomorrow as we highlight toxicologists dedicated to researching and mitigating climate change. I'm Tanya Papanicholas, and I'll catch you tomorrow.